Hey, good folks. Welcome to Psychology Noir. Dr. Lund here. So, how many of you have heard of Charles Manson and the Manson family murders? My guess is most people in the universe have heard of Charles Manson and have some knowledge regarding the Manson family murders that happened back in 1969. So what's resurrected this horrendous story again is Leslie Van Houten, who you see on the screen, who was one of Manson's family and involved in the murders, is fighting for her parole at the age of 73 years old, and she's been incarcerated for the murders at least 50 years. Here's just a little refresher for your memories is along with Van Houten, Susan Atkins, Patricia Krenwinkel, Tex Watson, and of course Charles Manson were all sentenced to death as a result of their trial. Linda Kasabian, who was also present at both murders, had testified against the family and was given immunity for her testimony, so she never served any jail time. Now, Van Houten was arrested and charged in relation to the 1996 killings of Leo and Rosemary LaBianca. She was convicted, sentenced to death as they all were. However, the California Supreme Court decision ruled in 1972 that the death penalty was unconstitutional, resulting in her sentence being commuted to life in prison. Interestingly, which I did not know, is her initial conviction was then overturned in 1976 from an appeal by the appellate court decision, which granted her a retrial. In Leslie's second trial, it ended with a deadlock jury and a mistrial. And then at her third trial in 1978, which I didn't realize there was a third trial, she was convicted of two counts of murder and one count of conspiracy and sentenced to seven years to life in prison. However, under this conviction, after seven years, she would be eligible for parole. Now here's an interesting fun fact, is in between the second trial where it was a mistrial and the third trial, Leslie was out on bail. I never knew that. That kind of sort of astounds me for such a heinous crime. She was in fact out on bail. So here's a recap of Van Houten's history with the parole board. Up until 2013, she was denied parole 20 times. Then in 2016, the parole board recommended she be paroled. However, Jerry Brown, the governor at the time in California, vetoed her parole. That happened again in 2017, where she was recommended parole, but again, Brown vetoed that action. So in 2019, 2020, 2021, she was again recommended for parole by the parole board, and then Governor Gavin Newsom had vetoed her parole up until May 30th, 2023, where a California Court of Appeal in Los Angeles set aside Governor Newsom's denial of Leslie's parole, thus becoming the first Manson family member to have a court rule in her favor for a parole recommendation. At this point, the governor can appeal the decision to the California Supreme Court to further block her release. And that news is yet to come. So trying to figure out what I thought 
on a psychological level about giving this woman parole. I figured what I had to do was go back and look at some of the information, watch some of the documentaries, and <laughs> boy, are there many documentaries to be had. I have been in the rabbit hole of the Manson family for about the last two weeks because there is so much information and books and articles generated about this animalistic, grisly murder spree that I thought, let me look back to see where we were and where we came from in order to make some kind of opinion about should Leslie Van Houten be given parole. How poetic a train goes by as we're going to take a trip back in time. Let's just consider that the peace train. So I was born in the late 50s. So the 60s, that decade, I was mainly preteen and really not aware of what was going on. Preteens have other things to deal with. So I don't remember much about the news about the Manson murders. I remember some TV specials about it, some news, regular news casts about it, but not much else. So as I went back and kind of researched the times, I mean, the 60s basically was the decade of love. Um, lots of drugs, the Vietnam War, LSD, speed, pot, um, Timothy Leary, the professor from Harvard who coined the phrase, turn on, tune in, and drop out. Um, so the hippie movement, some of the crazy fashions that you see, which at least looking back at them, they look pretty crazy to me. The one factor I thought about when 60s term about free love, free sex, that whole idea is, remember, in the 1960s, the pill was available and used for contraception. And so at that time, I wonder if that sort of opened the door where sex was more than just procreating and keeping the population going. But it was more looked at as enjoyment. San Francisco seemed to be the epicenter of the hippie movement and the free love movement, especially the Haight-Ashbury district. While researching this era, I found so many threads to so many people and events and activities that I really hadn't sat down and put together in one sitting. Um, and so let, let me review what I found somewhat fascinating on some level of all the associations that this particular crime spree entailed. The one verified truth that Manson would talk about in some, if not all, of his interviews were his horrendous beginnings with a mom who gave birth to him at 15, was in and out of jail, sometimes for prostitution, went to prison for a holdup using a ketchup bottle as a gun. And so he was shoved from person to person who really didn't want him. But interestingly, at 14, it looks like, he was going to go to Boys Town, where he only stayed for four days before he stole the car and was then again arrested. So on some level, I can see where he developed a skill, especially during the 60s, where kids 
for rebelling against parents and the establishment where he had lived through really being on his own and being incarcerated and having to manipulate his way, be bullied, taken advantage of, and deal with a host of different types of abuse, but utilize it as really the cult leader that he became to the young people that became his flock and his family. By the time Manson was 32 years old, he had already spent 17 years incarcerated somewhere, a juvenile home, a jail, or a prison. Now listen to this connection. When Manson was incarcerated in Terminal Island, he met a member of the Ma Barker gang. (laughs) For folks who don't know who Ma Barker is or think that she's just a fictional character, She was actually the matriarch of an outlaw gang that included her sons and others that were involved in things like payroll and bank robberies, kidnapping. And she died in 1935 during a shootout with the FBI. Well, anyway, this member of that gang spent a lot of time with Manson and actually taught him how to play the guitar. And so this really was kind of his first connection to music, songwriting, singing, something that becomes very significant at the time of the murders. One thing I found really interesting was that in 1967, when Manson was slated to be released from Terminal Island, He asked them to let him stay, citing that he didn't know if he would be able to make it on the outside because he had been incarcerated most of his life. And of course, legally, they had to let him go. And this was two years before the murders. Now, after Manson gets out of prison, and forms or starting starts to form his family, so to speak, it is just remarkable how worlds collide. That during this time is when two of his female family members hitchhike and meet Dennis Wilson of the Beach Boys, who takes the girls back to his house goes off to do some recording, comes back, and most of the Manson family is now in his house. And so these folks lived with Manson, I'm sorry, lived with Wilson for months and months. They weren't just casual acquaintances. In fact, Dennis Wilson took Manson around and introduced him to a lot of music moguls um, and really believed that he had talent. In fact, he thought he was so talented that the Beach Boys actually took one of Manson's songs, retitled it, changed some words, and put it on their 2020 album. But Wilson also introduced Manson to Terry Melcher, who was the producer of The Birds, as well as Paul Revere and the Raiders, and whose mother was Doris Day. Although Dennis Wilson convinced Terry Melcher to give Manson an audition, thinking he had talent, Melcher heard some of Manson's songs, but wasn't really impressed and pretty much put him off and never offered him a record deal. So between being put off by Melcher and then finding out the Beach Boys basically stole one of his songs and gave him no credit, Manson was getting pretty fueled 
and fired up by all the disappointment and lies from the music industry. And interestingly, Melcher and Candace Bergman lived in the house on Cielo Drive where the Manson family committed the first night of murders, but had rented it to Sharon Tate and Roman Polanski, who, of course, Sharon Tate was murdered there. And as most folks know, the Beatles' White Album seemed to be sort of the banner that Manson chose to carry with Helter Skelter, which incidentally was the name of the book that the prosecutor, Vincent Bugliosi, um, had written about the trial and about the murders. Again, as more worlds collide, I always wondered how the police figured out it was the Manson's group. But coincidentally, Susan Atkins, who was a member of Manson's family and who was arrested for a different murder of Gary Hinman, bragged to another inmate in jail about the murders and that inmate then turned Atkins in, who basically gave the story of the two nights of murders and who and how they were committed. In another collision of worlds, as the trial was going on, President Nixon, in the speech he was giving to the country that contained or included these murders, basically said that Manson was guilty, which stopped the trial because as that happened, as Manson was in court, he held up a newspaper with the heading that Nixon claims Manson is guilty. As I said, that stopped the trial the jury had to be then polled and questioned about if that statement from the president would influence anything about their verdict and their decision making. <laughs> wow. And you may be asking, what does the Lennon sisters have to do with the Charles Manson murders? Or you may be asking, who are the Lennon sisters? And if you were a fan of Lawrence Welk, back in the day, the Lennon sisters were a group of four sisters from a family of 11 that were basically the featured stars of the Lawrence Welk show. But because of the fear and the trepidation and the panic that the Manson murders caused during the month of August in 1969, by happenstance, and a horrible happenstance, the father of the Lennon sisters was murdered by a stalker during that month. And at first, it was believed there was some connection. However, after investigations, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it was found that there was, in fact, no connection with the murder of the Lennon sisters' father and the Manson family. Again, what a weird, weird situation, a horrible situation, but all these threads, and these are just some of the threads that I thought were really kind of interesting and many of the details I didn't know until I again went down that rabbit hole. One of the sentiments I had heard in different newscasts or documentaries from the past about this case was that it was a 
facilitated by a change in culture, a change in attitude. And sort of without those factors being a perfect storm, this kind of mind control, uh, brainwashing, if you will, cult behavior could never happen or happen again. And interestingly, I don't know if that was wishful thinking or just being naive, it has happened again and again and again, most recently with the Lori Vallow case and the soon-to-be the Chad Daybell trial of, again, cult-like behavior, manipulation, murder. Van Houten's life really took a dark turn when she joined the Manson family when she was only 19 in 1968. With Manson's manipulation, she really became a devoted follower and participant in the gruesome crimes that really shocked the nation and the world. Her role in the Manson family murders became evident during the Tate LaBianca killings that occurred in August of 1969. Now, she did not directly participate in the murders at the Sharon Tate residence. She did play an active and direct role in the brutal murder of the LaBiancas. Alongside Manson's other family members, she entered the home of Leo and Rose Mary LaBianca, restrained and stabbed them as a part of this twisted ideology about helter-skelter, race war, getting back at the music industry, whatever the motive was. She was there and she was an active participant and has admitted to this. My sense is that this woman is not a danger to society at this point in time. I'm sure if that was the case, all the psychological evaluations and therapy notes would support that she was, even though her parole had been denied by the governors stating that they didn't feel that she was safe to be released. I really think that the issue is no matter what type of rehabilitation Leslie Van Houten has done in the last 50 years, she will always be associated as a member of the Manson family, no matter how far she's come in recognizing her dependence, how she was manipulated, how she allowed herself to be manipulated. She will always be associated with the Manson family and the absolutely animalistic, heinous crimes that were committed by this group and her being a part of it. I can understand both sides on a legal realm. After seven years, she was eligible for parole. And that was many, many years ago. And I can also see the family members, especially Sharon Tate's sister, who has gone to what I believe is every parole hearing to state her case and the effects of what her family has gone through. And no matter how much time has gone by, as she has said, my sister will never get out of her grave. She has no parole. So my hunch is I would be surprised if she was in fact released 
although it's definitely a possibility. I think with the parole board on her side, as well as now the California Appellate Court siding that she should be paroled. If the governor decides to go to the California Supreme Court to block it, he will definitely need documentation to support that reason, which may be difficult at this point in time. So there it is, folks. It is a challenging and emotionally difficult decision to be made. We'll see what's going to happen down the road, but please leave me your thoughts on what you think should happen. Should Leslie Van Houten be paroled after 50 plus years in prison and apparently substantial documentation that she has been rehabilitated or should she remain in prison for basically the rest of her life i thank you all for watching and i will see you in the next one